Hi, everyone, and thanks for joining us for today's program, History at High Noon, Polly Murray House. This program is part of the programming for our exhibit, Polly Murray, Imp Crusader, Dude Priest, on display here at the museum now through November 27th. My name is Stacy, and I handle adult education here at the museum. If you enjoyed today's program, we invite you to head over to the museum's website at ncmuseumofhistory.org where you can learn more about our upcoming programs, exhibits, and digital resources. This is also where you can find more information about shopping in our wonderful museum shop and joining our North Carolina Museum of History Associates. Our associates and foundation provide crucial funding and support to the museum, which in addition to many other things, helps make programs like today's program possible. A few quick housekeeping items for today. We ask that you please keep your mics muted throughout the entirety of the program and to please type any questions that you have for our guest speaker into the chat function located at the bottom center of your screen. At the end of the program, our adult programs intern will ask our speaker as many of your questions as time allows. So now it's my honor to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Anna Agby Davies, who is a historical archaeologist with research interests in the plantation societies of the colonial southeastern U.S. and Caribbean, as well as towns and cities of the 19th and 20th century Midwest, with a particular focus on the African diaspora. Dr. Agby Davies received a PhD from the University of Pennsylvania after completing a dissertation examining locally made clay tobacco pipes from rural and urban sites in and around Jamestown, Virginia. Prior to that, served as the as staff archaeologist for the Colonial Williamsburg Foundation's Department of Archaeological Research, and even earlier, an undergraduate at the College of William and Mary. Before coming to UNC, Dr. Agby Davies was an assistant professor in the Anthropology Department at DePaul University. Recent research projects include excavation and community collaboration at the sites of New Philadelphia, Illinois, and the Phyllis Wheatley Home for Girls on the south side of Chicago. So Dr. Aggie Davies, welcome. I'm gonna turn it over to you. Great, thank you so much for that kind introduction. And I'm so delighted to be here with you all today to um, connect my research with this really wonderful exhibit that's at the museum right now. Uh, the first time I saw this exhibit of Polly Murray's photographs and, and scrapbooks, uh, it was before I began my research and excavation at her childhood home. And so now to have the opportunity to view it again through a different perspective is really exciting for me. And I hope that the talk that I'm presenting today will give you additional thoughts as you view or view again this really terrific exhibit. Um, so I've titled my talk, The Miseducation of Polly Murray. We'll spend a little bit of time explaining that but to move immediately into the talk, I want to begin by saying thank you to all of the individuals and organizations who made this work possible. I would not have gotten involved in work at the Polly Murray Family Home if it weren't for Barbara Lau, who's the executive director of the Polly Murray Center for History and Social Justice. Um, our partnership has been so enriching for me. And I came to Carolina not knowing anything about Polly Murray and her important role in American history and her connections to Durham. So I'm really grateful that I've been looped into this project uh, by Barbara Lau. I'd also like to thank the Carolina Center for Public Service and my university, University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill for the financial support to conduct some of the excavations and lab-based research. Also, Eric Dietz was my co-principal investigator, helped me. Um, we worked together on the design of the field research and the excavation. My graduate student, Colleen Betty, was a field supervisor and a lab coordinator. She helped work with students in some of my classes who were working at the site, along with field volunteers from the community. And then two other students, Sierra Rourke and William Raglan, were catalogers, helped identify all of the artifacts that we recovered, and we had the help of volunteers there again. And then I also want to thank those organizations who've invited me to talk about this research over the years, including the Bard Graduate Center, Duke University, my own department at UNCCH, and also Davidson College. So those are some of the um, individuals and groups who have 
helped develop this talk as it evolves. Um, and now I will turn to the substance of our conversation. So this is a quotation I really love from Polly Murray. She said in the course of an oral history interview, I'm a radical to the extent that I want to see the individual human being as free as is possible to fulfill that individual human being's potential, creative potential. These words come from an oral history interview with Polly Murray, who was a poet, an attorney, a priest, um, in everything, a worker for human rights. Murray grew up in early 20th century Durham, North Carolina, a time and a place where her um, human potential was severely constrained by the structures of society. Perhaps most obvious to us is the way that she was understood according to some essential categories as a woman, as what was then called a Negro. Those essential categories came with limitations. And in some sense, her body was a sign that reference that pointed to these identities, femaleness, coloredness, things that were identified by signs. In her book, Fighting Words, sociologist Patricia Hill Collins explains that the everyday struggles of women were seldom recognized as political activism. And Collins argues for that we should recharacterize the pursuit of human rights so that it includes um, everyday activities. She wants, and this is a quote, new opportunities for thinking through Black women's pragmatic, everyday freedom struggles. Thus, rebuilding the connection between that work, the things that happened every day, and more universal freedom struggles, such as those for human rights. Okay, so this talk today is part of a larger book project where I'm attempting to show how material culture, the things that people make and use every day, are part of these claims to humanity, this rights work. I'm examining Polly Murray's childhood home alongside another archeological site, the Phyllis Wheatley Home for Girls in Chicago, uh, because I see these as places where African-American women made and remade themselves and their society in a form that was gradually becoming more supportive of the fulfillment of their human potential. So I think that this, these daily efforts, these routine activities are an unacknowledged and, and underexamined part of these movements for human rights, including demands for full citizenship regardless of race and for gender equality. So most of us know um, key figures, often men, who were really important in the US civil rights movement, or we might be able to name important dates or legal milestones in the struggle for gender equality. But what I'm saying is that alongside this conceptual uh, reframing of society, there's also material changes, things that are happening every day in our lives that respond to and kind of work with those um, <clears throat> conceptual changes. So what I'm trying to do is to understand how race women made themselves and remade their society through daily action. Excuse me. So as an anthropologist, the thing I'm most interested in is what does it mean to be human? And the group of ideas that I use to guide that quest is um, what they all share is a sense that humans, we, we are not best defined by our essences or the categories that we fit into, but we should be thinking about humans and our, our projects that we are kind of in the process of becoming. So with the quotation that I started the talk with, Polly Murray is acknowledging the significance of this kind of in process sense of what it means to be human. And that's why she's so opposed to efforts to um, deny people self-determination or to you know, limit them from reaching their full potential. 
So in addition to being an anthropologist, I'm also an archeologist. <clears throat> and so part of what I want to, excuse me. <laughs> part of what I want to do is think through what things have to do with being human. So just like we rely on and interact with other people, we also rely on and interact with things in the course of our daily lives. And the things shape who we are and we shape what the things are. So one of the things that I find so wonderful about us as human beings is our ability to make meaning to, to make sense of the world, to move around through it and interact with others using what archeologists call material culture, right? Those parts of, of our social lives that have a tangible form, okay? And this is important analytically. I also think it's um, a source of great hope for me because what we discover when we look at people and our relationships with things is we see that while we are contained within social structures, we also have the potential to change them and affect them, right? We're not prisoners of our times, but we can be active agents. So this is all kind of the backdrop for why I'm so interested in exploring women's daily actions um, towards rights work. And I'm wondering, you know, what, what new worlds were made possible by the actions that we can identify um, in the archeological record? Um, how is our world different because of what they did then? The focus of my research um, right now is the way that ideas about gender are expressed through material culture, especially the material culture of dress. So the way this talk is gonna flow, I'm gonna begin with a discussion of the intersections between gender and race and how those were being expressed in the first half of the 20th century. And I'll be doing that using texts from the period, um, especially because I'm interested in kind of explicit explanations of the values and norms that people held during that period. I'm gonna be using texts that contain advice of different kinds. I'm also going to be examining the stated and unstated messages uh, contained within the Chicago Defender, which was an African-American newspaper that circulated throughout the United States. Then I'm going to turn to the excavation results from our work at the Polly Murray family home um, as they relate to dress and signs about gender. So I've titled the talk as I have because I wanna focus our attention on the lessons that Polly Murray would have been receiving about what was expected of them as a girl and a young woman while living in the childhood home. Many of these lessons she came to reject later in life as she expressed in an essay on relations between men and women that I think is on another level also about this theme of human opportunity. So this is what she said, our general miseducation of the sexes and our outmoded social taboos have helped to form rigid molds into which the sexes are poured and which determine in advance the role men and women are to play in community life. So I don't wanna to spend too much time on kind of the theoretical backdrop that shapes my research. But I think one thing that's important to um, let you in on for this talk is that I'm very interested in theories of communication that emphasize not only the role of the person who is making the sign, right? The person who is uh, saying the word, wearing the clothing, doing the dance, like producing, communication, not only that person, not only the sign itself, not only the item of clothing or the dance move or the word, but 
but also the person who's receiving that information, right? This is a, a category that's called in linguistics, the interpretant, right? So we don't only focus on the person who is putting out the message and the message itself, we're also interested in how the message is received and the effect of the message. So today I'm gonna to be talking about signs that have to do with something that we might call womanhood or femininity um, and use them to guide our understanding of Polly Murray and the settings in which they grew up and the context in which they received these various forms of education or perhaps miseducation. So since the larger book project explores the ways that uh, ideas about race and gender were shaping and were also shaped by black women's social activism in the 20th century, um, I feel like I also need to interject hopefully the, the last bit of vocabulary for this talk and that is the idea of respectability. So for my project, I need to think about how this idea of respectability was kind of made material, how people played it out, how it was reinforced, how it was challenged using material culture, specifically in spaces occupied predominantly by African-American women. And I'll talk later um, about uh, the evidence for this at the Polly Murray family home. So what is respectability? Historian Victoria Walcott describes two strands of respectability. On the one hand, there's this value of, and this is a quote, values of hard work, thrift, piety, and sexual restraint. Then she also talks about this second set of kind of very clearly middle-class values that are expressions of the first list through such means as dress, deportment, and organizational culture. So as an archeologist, I'm looking at these wonderful photographs um, from Chicago um, in the 1940s. And I'm thinking about how ideas about women's participation in organizational culture are reflected in objects in this scene, right? And the way that this photo is included, the work that she's doing, the way that she's sitting, the banner proclaiming her the mayor of Wellstown, right? Likewise, the posture of these girls, the instruments that they're playing, the contrast between the refinement that's being suggested by their activity, and then obviously the, the poor physical condition of their home. Right. And the way these women are navigating a hat shop and the questions that come to my mind about the choices that they're making, what might attract them about one hat or another, what message they might be trying to send with their dress. Right. <clears throat> so Walcott notes that respectability was especially strongly gendered. <clears throat> it was embodied deployed and often promoted by women. It was not unique to African-Americans. It was a widely shared idea across many racial groups in this period in the United States, but it had a special meaning for black women because they used it as a tool to fight against some of the more vicious racist stereotypes about themselves and about the communities that they came from. So if we wanna think about this in linguistic terms, the material culture of womanliness was not only a symbol of a woman's interior state, but it was actually kind of an unfakeable sign of, like I said, her inner state, her place in her family and her place in society. Okay. And there are multiple intersections at work here, including gender and race as we've already discussed, but also class. Some important African-American public intellectuals like Anna Julia Cooper, Fanny Barrier Williams, um, they merged respectability with another idea of uplift where women play a special role in racial advancement because of their influence over their homes and their families and because of their own moral qualities. 
So with all this background, you can imagine that respectability might mean something really different to somebody who's the stay at home wife of a doctor compared to somebody who works in domestic service, right? But across these categories, respectability was, and perhaps still is, an important strategy for pursuing social mobility and racial justice. Okay. At the same time, in her autobiography, Murray describes the social climate in which she came of age. So she mentions this um, 1943 survey by a leading African American newspaper, which found that over 70% of respondents, presumably themselves also African-American, 70% of respondents opposed nonviolent disobedience campaigns because they were concerned that they would be more harmful than helpful to the Negro cause. And then she goes on later in the book to write, many parents of Howard University students, and at this time, um, Murray was a, a law student at Howard. She was the only female law student in her cohort. Um, many parents of Howard University students, particularly the parents of teenage girls, adhered to middle class standards of respectability and would be horrified at the thought of their daughters tangling with the police, being arrested and thrown in jail. Breaking the code of respectability was as formidable a barrier to action as the prospect of police brutality. So what she's telling us here is that respectability is kind of a double edged sword, right? You can use it to support arguments for racial equality, but it also limits the way in which you can fight for racial equality, especially if one is a woman. So, um, so I'm, that's another reason I'm interested in these parallel projects because ideas about respectability closed off some options for some women. Women in the Fitzgerald household were involved in these projects of uplift and racial justice in some other ways. So the model of female respectability seemed central to the humanity of Cornelia Fitzgerald and Pauline Dame. Uh, they were Murray's maternal grandmother and maternal aunt. And if you've ever had the pleasure of reading um, Murray's family history, Proud Shoes, you know that it opens with this kind of epic struggle by Cornelia Fitzgerald to get her neighbors to acknowledge her status as a landowner, to um, understand the significance of her parentage. Um, it's really key to Fitzgerald's sense of herself, Polly Murray's grandmother. Now, Pauline Dame, who is shown in this photograph, I'm, let's see here, I hope you can see in this uh, screen, Pauline Dame is shown standing, okay, she was a teacher dedicated to the cause of education, including the personal discipline aspects uh, that are often associated with uplift. Um, her own household broke apart when she refused to follow her husband across the color line um, and then later moved back home to care for her aging parents. And then soon after that, uh, the daughter of her dead sister. That toddler, Polly Murray, grew up with a different orientation towards standards of female decorum and ambition. And the signs that indexed their outlook manifested in their daily life. So Murray's concept of her own sex and gender was not so clear cut as these um, norms suggest. From a young age, Murray expressed a strong preference for clothing typically worn by boys. It appears that Pauline Dame, their adoptive mother, did not try to force conventional choices on the child and allowed them to dress as they pleased. Later in life, Murray adopted men's clothing strategically, especially while traveling. Whether navigating the dangers of hitchhiking and riding the rails or the risks associated with segregated public transport, she seems to have felt safer in men's wear. As an adult, Murray's most enduring romantic partnerships were with women. Her private correspondence includes letters exchanged with doctors with whom, from whom she sought treatment to more fully reveal the masculine person she knew herself to be. As a public intellectual, she argued against this general miseducation of the sexes. As a human rights attorney, 
she sought to remove barriers based on categories of person that she referred to as permanent, including the categories that we often call race and sex. So while this paper is treating dress artifacts as signs of gender, um, I want to be really clear that the association between the sign and the meaning that it conveys is, is imprecise and it shifts um, through time. So as I mentioned, correct behavior was a crucial weapon in the struggle for racial equality. And as we've already seen, ironically, women bore the heavier burden, not only for their own behavior, but in their role as actual or potential mothers of the race. Here, I'm gonna briefly consider the educational efforts of two women who made it not only their personal responsibility, but their professional responsibility to teach lessons about womanhood. And then I'm gonna link those lessons to the miseducation that Murray referred to. So Nanny Burroughs was the founder and director of the National Training School for Girls in Washington, DC. She gave a speech in 1914 the year that Polly Murray turned four, in which she argued that, and this is a quote, no woman can render better service to the race than by teaching the ill-bred boys and girls good manners. It's an end quote. Um, oh, sorry, there's another piece to it. She also noted that, quote, mothers are failing to teach common good manners, end quote. She went on to illustrate this point, um, describing examples of young men and young women disgracing themselves and by extension, potentially disgracing the race, specifically on public transportation. So she talks about these boys messily eating some food and then kind of littering the streetcar with the remnants. She noted that they were dressed up, but then went on to say and, and criticized them as, this is a quote from her, more animals than men, end quote. The girls um, were conspicuously whispering about and laughing at another passenger. Um, for snubbing them, but Burroughs suggested they should rather gently rebuke her, right, and not engage in tit for tat. A generation after Burroughs' speech, Charlotte Hawkins Brown, who many of you may know, another North Carolinian, she's founder of the Palmer Memorial Institute in Guilford County, um, and she was an expert on, and this is the way her book was titled, the correct thing to do, to say, and this is crucial, to wear. In that book, she laid out behavioral standards for respectable young men and women. In her chapter devoted to the men and boys who care, she reassured her readers that to be a gentleman was both honorable and manly. However, she also explicitly stated that probably a man or a boy's primary motivation for doing things correctly was so that he wouldn't embarrass the lady in his life. And indeed, most of the gender specific advice that she gives in the book is geared towards girls and women. Brown is careful to instruct young people and their household contributions not to restrict themselves to boys or girls chores. In the chapter on behavior at home, she writes, quote, offer your assistance in whatever work needs to be done. Don't think that you can't wash dishes because you're a boy or you would not dare to clean up the front yard because you are a girl. So at the same time though, she's also sending these other kind of back channel messages saying things like being recognized as an ideal hostess is every woman's desire. So these are some things she's um, suggested about behavior. I wanna to focus today on her remarks about dress. So for men and boys, mostly she's talking about degrees of formality, you know, if you, when would you wear a dinner coat? What can you wear at a range of social occasions? Like if you're at a dance, if you're camping, whether you can wear a sweater instead of a coat, those kinds of things. The advice for women and girls is much more detailed. She talks a little bit about comfort and practicality as well as formality, but she also goes in great detail about the features of the clothing, color, cut, texture, things that add to or detract from attractiveness. She offers four pages worth of rules for choosing what to wear to school, while you're shopping, at tea, at a dance. 
boys get one line of advice about grooming, which interestingly enough is about overly scented soaps or colognes. Girls get an entire chapter on how to care for and present the body. So those are some examples of direct and explicit education about the sexes. And I'm gonna skip forward a slide because I realized I have slides from a different version. So if you wanna talk about Princess Mysteria later, she's a wonderful, a wonderful figure, but not included in the text of what I'm talking about today. There we go. So those are some examples of direct and explicit education about the sexes and the roles they are meant to play in community life and the material culture with which they're meant to do it. The intersection of dress and sociability can also be seen in the Chicago Defender, for example, in the society column and in stories about weddings or other major parties. In many such cases, the men's clothing goes unmentioned. But consider the way in which the gowns of Miss Christine M. Young and the 12 female members of her bridal party were described in minute detail. Again, color, cut, cloth. The former teacher walked down the aisle in, quote, a creation of white Georgette crepe and lace trimmed with pearls over satin, wearing a veil of silk tulle gathered gracefully wreathed with orange. So these are high style, fancy occasion dresses, but advertisements for everyday dress also revealed a similar concern for details, <clears throat> even though the clothing was much less elaborate. So these small format black and white illustrations meant that retailers had to rely on verbal descriptions to express the appearance of their wares. The things that um, they mentioned suggest that the things that people desired um, were the incorporation of new design elements and also color. Fortunately for me as an archeologist, the kinds of things that are mentioned in the ads are the very details that we're unlikely to find archeologically, right? So we're finding things like fasteners and packaging, whereas the ads are talking about things like the material and the design and especially the cost. So there's a nice complementarity to the different kinds of evidence we have to work with when we bring the text together with the objects. Like in this ad, the drawings of the ready-made dresses depict the shorter, freer style of the modern woman. The exposed legs and less restrictive profile introduced by the flapper had by this time become somewhat respectable, right? You'll see even in photographs in the, on the society pages that matrons were just as likely as modern girls to wear something with the latest flared skirt or the new two-way collar. The dress that had once been a sign of rebellion and a form of sexual freedom was by this time more mainstream. So when people talk about the flapper in this period, um, the problem is not so much that she's immodest or improper, but it's that she's frivolous, right? Um, what one writer says in reference to uh, Nanny Burroughs' school is you can't build the womanhood of a strong and sterling race upon the basis of the flapper. So it's about um, her commitment to the cause as much as her own respectability by this point in time. So my strong focus on gender and more narrowly womanhood or womanliness is inspired by the fact that most of the time that Polly Murray lived in the family home, the only other residents were women. From the time the house was built around 1898 until 1919, there may have been as many as two men living in the home at any given time. Robert Fitzgerald, who was Murray's grandfather and Thomas Fitzgerald who was her uncle. Thomas left as early as 1900. Um, Murray arrived as a three-year-old in 1914, right? So well after that. And Robert Fitzgerald in the years leading up to his death in 1919, spent much of his time at the National Home for Disabled Volunteer Soldiers in Hampton, Virginia. By the time we read the 1920 census, the household was headed by Cornelia Fitzgerald and included the widowed Pauline Dame and also Murray, um, 
who the census taker had referred to as a border. Cornelia died in 1924. And after Murray's departure in 1926 to continue her education in New York, Dame lived in the family home, later joined by Sally Smalls, another one of Murray's aunts. These two women remained in the family home until in their later years, they moved away to live with Murray in 1949. So I say all that to say this, there were long stretches of time during which the Polly Murray family home was occupied exclusively by people identified as women. In the remainder of this talk, I'm gonna focus on how the material culture of dress relates to Murray's education about what it meant to be a woman. So we're talking here about dress. These artifacts have a long association with ideas and ideals about gender, specifically constructing and maintaining and kind of embellishing categories that we might have like girl or lady, female or woman. I'm considering dress in the quite broad terms explained by Eicher and Rock Higgins by that I mean dress consists of an assemblage of changes to the body as well as items added to the body. So in addition to items properly understood as clothing or jewelry, in the book, I'm also concerned with things like cosmetics and toiletries and all the practices that go along with them, as well as items that are carried on the body. Um, colleagues of mine, archeologists take an interesting approach, Thomas and Thomas, they think about zones or, or layers of dress, right? Um, the body itself, which might include grooming preparations and tools, items worn against the body, such as jewelry or clothing, which at archeological sites is mostly represented by fasteners and labels and packaging. They also talk about another layer, accessories that appear outside the clothing, something like a purse or an umbrella or a fan. All of these forms of material culture reflect and as an archeologist, I would say produce specific kinds of person. Archeologists are frequently considering how dress is involved in producing and maintaining identities as well as class distinctions. Archaeologists who are interested in gender have moved away from quote unquote discovering women in the archaeological record. So just like we we're beginning to come to terms with how the socially constructed idea of race affects our analysis, we're also grappling with a problem of how to kind of exploit the tension between assuming that biological sex and gender are the same thing while also acknowledging that these categories along with sexuality, they all reinforce one another and work in tension, I guess is the best way to put it. Queer theories emphasis on performance and on seeing, again, thinking about signs, um, may prove a productive way forward. So by this, what I, I really want you to understand is that I'm not, as interested in saying, okay, I found this kind of button at the site, or I found this button at the site, which means it was a man's shirt. And then making an even greater leap to, to say a man was the person wearing it. Rather, I'm interested in seeing how these artifacts tell us what the people at the site were doing with clothing and um, how it could have been involved in projects, including expressing gendered identity, as well as other aspects of life in the home. There we go. At the Polly Murray family home, some forms of dress artifacts are concentrated um, in a restricted area. So all but three of the 53 buttons that we found on the site came from deposits in the area immediately behind the house. Uh, between the shed addition that housed the kitchen and the fence that marked the boundary with Maplewood Cemetery. They cluster especially at the northwest corner of the house in test unit four. 
the upper levels of test unit four uncovered a deposit of household refuse that appeared to be from the first half of the 20th century. Shovel test pits, which are not shown on this map, um, indicate that this midden or sheet refuse layer extends at least another five meters to the north. So the, the area where we found these artifacts concentrated is right here. And then by um, testing further out, we know that it extends at least another five meters. So it's, it's in a quite large area. And because the shovel tests are not shown on this map, you can't tell that all of this area has been e examined as well. And really the clothing related items are tightly clustered back here. Additional clothing fasteners, so besides buttons, things like zippers, snaps, buckles, they come exclusively from deposits to the rear of the house, disproportionately from the Northwest corner, where we suggest that laundry was washed or at least washing water was poured out. The Southwest corner, right back here, is where we located, well, here, let me show you more precisely, where we located what we have tentatively identified as the Fitzgerald's abandoned well. So that's more over here, as well as a present day clothesline. And then this area right here is where we also found uh, fragments of clothes pins. So based on the stratigraphic, the, the layering relationships between the midden and some other features of the site, we'll, we feel pretty confident that the artifacts that we're looking at represent the period where the, when the site was occupied by members of the extended Fitzgerald family, including Murray. So, um, and I also wanna point out that we believe these are not only from the period that the Fitzgerald were, were there, but also uh, represent their own clothing related artifacts. Because what is probably difficult to see in the slide, this is a, uh, the census sheet from 1930, um, what you might be able to, okay, so here's the family, the members of the family who were there. And then if I advance again, yeah, you'll see that there are several um, other people living on the block who are laundresses. So there, and two of them were taking in laundry. So laundress who worked at home. So they were working for clients, but doing the laundry at their homes. This was not the case. Um, with the uh, members of the extended Fitzgerald family. So at these sites, we might imagine that some of the clothing related artifacts don't belong to the people who lived in the house. But in this case, we, we feel fairly certain that they are connected to, um, like I said, this family. Another explanation for the preponderance of clothing fasteners, um, in addition to laundry, could be the repair and repurposing of clothing. For example, I have a colleague and friend who did a study of clothing ensembles recovered from the third New City Cemetery in Houston's Freedman's Town from about 1880 to 1904. And in that work, she, demonstrate how, she demonstrates how frequently choices about dress included decisions to repair rather than replace clothing and to reuse and recycle fasteners. In her autobiography, Marie mentions that some of the clothing that she wore consisted of hand-me-downs from her aunt and cut down adult dresses. Uh, she writes, grandmother made patchwork quilts and knitted woolen scarves and shawls. Aunt Pauline, though not a fancy dressmaker, made over her old clothes and cut down adult dresses for me. I tested the possibility that the snaps in the assemblage, many of which appear to be from a single item of clothing, uh, that, they may have rep that they may represent someone removing fasteners in order to reuse, um, let's see, I've lost my place here, <laughs> to reuse the cloth. Okay, but so far I've been unable to detect any statistically significant difference in the distribution of snaps versus other fasteners or between damaged and complete fasteners of all kinds. You can imagine that a damaged fastener could have, um, the damage could be the reason that it was discarded that was lost. Um, you could also imagine that complete fasteners, ones that still could be reused 
might be distributed in a, in a different way across a site. That is not proving to be the case. So in other words, fasteners um, that were lost versus fasteners that were deliberately removed while still functional. So as far as I've been able to tell so far, it appears that all of the fasteners were added to the site through similar processes. Again, most likely laundering rather than other forms of clothing maintenance. We get a slightly different story from the textile fragment. So cloth, unlike the fasteners, comes from all across the site. Even fragments that appear to be from the same item of clothing are widely scattered. I'm especially excited by these two fragments that have identical dimensions and hopefully you can see they've been deliberately pinked, right? So somebody has made them this shape for some reason, okay? Um, all of these facts for me build a circumstantial case for another formation process, quilting, or at least fabric reuse, as described in Murray's family history. Grandmother was squatting in the grass between the kitchen window and the well shed, sorting old scraps of cloth from a basket and spreading them about to sun. From the cemetery fence to the front yard, the lawn was strewn with strips of red flannel, blue serge, colored ginghams, ragged shirts, faded petticoats, and brown stocking tops. So now we have a picture of what activities might have been taking place at the site. Now I want to put them into a wider context. In her autobiography, Murray drew attention to the childhood chores that maintained the home that they shared with their grandparents and aunts. She describes the dwelling as a homestead and the family as one of farmers, despite the fact that Durham was becoming gradually closer and closer each year. And despite the fact that members of the family were employed in non-agricultural pursuits. During Murray's childhood, the family produced some of their own food. They kept a cow and chickens. They raised vegetables, including a small field of corn and tended fruit trees. Murray seemed grateful that the division of labor in their home meant not having to undertake indoor, what we might call domestic or women's work, things like cooking or sewing. Murray had plenty of wood chopping, whitewashing, outhouse cleaning and errand running to stay occupied and away from what she later called handicrafts. She reported as an older child chafing at having to take domestic science instead of shop class at school. Both of the dress related processes under discussion here, laundry and the production or maintenance of clothing, speak to the work that Murray associated with womanhood and rebelled against. And I'm, I'm curious because I think there are two ways of thinking about this. Um, one could argue that um, she hated these chores because they were associated with women. I'm more inclined to think that she hated the chores for themselves, but because they were associated with women, she took that as part of the evidence to question whether womanhood was a category for her. I don't think we can enter into her mind to that detail, but I, I think it's important that we realize that there are a couple of ways of reading, um, reading that information. So the last piece I wanna do here is compare the clothing related artifacts with uh, some of the findings again at this uh, third New City Cemetery in Houston. Obviously there are important differences in the ways that clothing enters a cemetery context compared with a residential yard like the Polly Murray family home. But this cemetery is the closest thing that I as an archeologist have to a living population of fasteners, like all the things that would go together in, a, in an ensemble, um, all the things in position on the body, perhaps. So not only individual isolated fasteners, but sets. Also important for this comparison is that Franklin has shown these fasteners to be signs of specific kinds of dress associated with specific kinds of bodies most notably for our purposes, male and female burials. Franklin found, for example, that both the type 
and the number of fasteners distinguished male versus female burials. So thinking through these different data sets, um, a comparison between the polymery family home assemblage and the third new city cemetery as a whole, and then the city cemetery partitioned um, by gender is kind of the first stage in that comparison. The cemetery assemblage had very few snaps and no zippers, even though both of those forms were available in the 1890s and the cemetery was in use until 1904. The polymery family home, on the other hand, had no collar or cuff studs. These were associated with male burials and no hook and eye fasteners and only a single safety pin. These are more commonly associated with female burials. So to the extent that it was possible to do some statistical uh, frequency tests with these fairly small numbers and um, sometimes cases where there are, are no examples of an artifact type. Um, in general, the home is a pretty sharp contrast with uh, the cemetery samples. So for example, when I look only at fasteners that occur at both sites, the fastener types from the home were significantly different from both male and female burials and from the cemetery as a whole. But the results fluctuated depending on how I group the artifacts. For example, do I include snaps as a kind of button or not? And also what archeological deposits I included. So breaking things up by earlier and later deposits or midden and non-midden context. The Prosser buttons, these are buttons that um, look like white glass or porcelain. Uh, the Prosser buttons that are so dominant in the cemetery assemblage are far outnumbered at the home by bone buttons. These materials were being used at the same time, um, as well as a new material, plastic. We can pinpoint the transition among these different material types. Um, when we look at the Montgomery's Montgomery Ward's catalog from 1914. The button page shows these cheap Prosser buttons, right? Um, but also features celluloid and imitation ivory, which were kind of the precursors to the petroleum-based plastics that we use uh, today. These materials were sold at a premium okay, when compared to everyday or plain shell buttons. Almost all of the high value buttons are types associated with women's clothing. And even the colored ivory buttons, which are um, for women's clothing, but then described as very mannish, um, are just the thing, as the catalog says, for tailor-made dresses. In the cemetery, the buttons were more strongly associated with male burials, especially the bone or porcelain prosser buttons including the new sew-through buttons that commonly appeared on trousers, but also on underwear and shirts designed for men and for women. The Polly Murray family home assemblage lacks the copper buttons that are typical of men's dress coats and vests, but offers examples of gaiters, which are more typical of women's and children's clothing, and also panty waist buttons. Franklin at the cemetery found that bone buttons were more associated with male burials, while the materials that I think of as kind of precursors to plastic, glass and rubber and so forth, are associated with female burials. Again, these numbers are very tiny, so it's not possible to test them statistically. So all of this is to suggest that despite their temporal overlap, the greatest differences between these two sites are explained by changes in fastener technology and in fashions more generally as well as I think the processes that brought these artifacts into the ground in the first place. So right now, what I'm trying to figure out is how these different fastener styles relate to time. And what I think is going on is that the modern style fasteners, so like zippers and snaps, don't seem to have any association with the modern material fasteners like plastic. So it's not only time that's organizing these 
um, differences. My hunch is that we are looking at the remnants of clothing that is somewhat more unisex than what is found at the cemetery, not necessarily in its design, in terms of the outfits that people are wearing, but in its construction, the bits from which it was assembled. So my next task is to start drilling down into the attachments of the buttons, the si their sizes, and to understand some other aspects of, of their variation. So I'm very clearly in the middle <laughs> of this research. The households of Black women um, employed a range of strategies to navigate a world shaped by patriarchy and white supremacy. At the Phyllis Wheatley Home for Girls, I saw efforts not to convince others of their respectability, but to use material culture to train themselves to better claim rights and protections due to women in traditional gender roles. At the Polly Murray Family Home, preliminary results are encouraging us to take seriously both the power of gender ideologies and the capacity for individuals to transcend these structures again, using material culture. So in conclusion, the signs of womanhood were all around the young Polly Murray, but they don't seem to have um, signified in the way that they were intended. As an adult, Murray questioned the education she had received about the role that men and women are meant to play in community life. It caused her considerable personal anguish, I believe, but it may also have been the source of some of her greatest insights and her strongest convictions. So that is what I have to share with you about dress at the Polly Murray family home. Um, I hope that there is time for questions and I hope that if there's any way I can elaborate on some of the things I've shared or if people would like to bring their own observations, now would be a good time. I'm going to stop sharing my screen We have uh, two questions in the chat, I think. Okay, great. Um, You're welcome. First, I'm sorry, I'm just responding to the chat question, the comment. <laughs> um, the first question is from Sarah Brinson, and she asks, were there differences in the concept of women's respectability in rural agricultural areas versus more urban areas like Durham? And then she said, as an example, tenant farmers who dressed in looser clothing and no bra due to the heat working outside, which would also indicate that a farming woman's place was not just in the home. Also, people in rural areas that could not afford dresses and such an ad shown earlier, $3.98 would have been like $65 to $80 today. Yeah. yeah. So the, the difference is in rural and urban, the way I'm seeing that play out most clearly is in the efforts by uh, people like Robert Abbott, the publisher of the, De the Defender, attempting to kind of remake rural migrants to urban cities in an urban image, right? So there was a strong effort from like the Defender, the Urban League, um, other organizations to get people coming from a rural context to conform to new notions of respectability. I don't think that respectability was absent in that rural context. I believe it was expressed differently. One of the, I was just talking about this with my class earlier this morning. Um, one of the um, challenges that people faced in Chicago or even in a place like Durham compared to outlying counties um, was kind of the movement of people, the number of strangers you found yourself surrounded by, the sort of short-term nature of some community relationships. And so the kinds of traditional um, checks that people might have on, you know, who, specifically who is my daughter associating with, um, you know, in a rural community, the, the potential of knowing the people you're surrounded by and knowing them well, having history with them is really different from what you have in a city where people are moving around a lot, people are new to the area. It's, it's difficult to 
monitor the behavior of women and girls in that setting. And it may be that material culture was leveraged to try to make up for that gap, right? So that the things that were possible, the ways that it was possible, the way that it was possible to be a woman or a girl in a rural context um, might not have been, couldn't be played out in the same way. They wouldn't be read in the same way in an urban context. Your point about how people dress for field work versus um, versus other activities. But there's, again, there's this strong interest in presenting the self. So um, people like Abbott or others offering advice would say, okay, you're working in domestic service. You, you have this, um, not really uniform, but you have this way, you have this uh, kind of clothing that you wear to do your work, right? Or you work in a meat packing plant or you work in any of these other um, locations tobacco warehouse for, for our area. Um, they're still arguing, sure, you, you have these work clothes um, that have to get messy and they're not very respectable, but wear street clothes to work. Don't show up on the street in the clothing that you work in, right? So there's this really strong effort to shape perceptions of individuals and shape perceptions of African Americans more generally through the material culture of dress. I, I hope that sort of got at, at some of the questions that you had. Thank you so much for answering that question. I think we have time for one more question. Um, let's see. Oh, okay. So someone asked, uh, Jean Robinson asked, if you are going to be looking into how Polly Marie and other women sometimes wore men's clothing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's part of the um, kind of the background knowledge that I'm bringing to this project, knowing that, um, as, I, as I hinted at, that the presence of the kind of button that's typical of man, men's clothing doesn't necessarily mean that a man was there wearing it, right? So I, I am kind of prepared to question the automatic association of a specific kind of clothing with a specific bodied person. And, and I think it's through what I have learned about Marie that has enabled me to kind of get outside these binary categories. And because I am learning to think more in a more nuanced way about gender from Polly Murray's example. It's allowing me to think about the artifacts in a more nuanced way and to not assume that I know what they mean right off the bat, that the, that the, the meaning of the artifact is not contained within the artifact itself, but it's in its use, it's in its deployment in communication context. I, I realize I'm getting very abstract there, so it might not be um, getting straight to the point of the, of the person's question, but, but yes, that's definitely a part of my thinking. And I believe um, what I have learned about Polly Murray from her own writing and from other people's scholarship about her has made me a better, archaeologist on this subject. Thank you so much, Dr. Abby Davies, for this wonderful presentation and for sharing your work with us. Um, you shared that you're in the middle. Uh, so <laughs> yes. if folks would like to follow along and kind of um, you know, enjoy sharing and all this progress you're, you're going to make, um, is there a way for them to do that? Is there anywhere, a, a site or any sort of way that they can kind of keep in touch? Well, it wouldn't be necessarily a way to keep in touch with me directly, but certainly to um, check out the website of the Polly Murray Center, right? They have, are constantly bringing programs to light. There is um, research by scholars like me and um, people who are commenting generally on the themes that are raised by Polly Murray's life. So, um, I don't want to 
break eye contact and try and find that information. <laughs> um, but you've got it. Okay. Yeah. So yes, they, <laughs> Yeah, that's a definitely a place to go to learn more about Polly Murray and her and her contributions and the way that she continues to inspire people to do brave, tough work today. That's that's where I would direct people. Absolutely. So y'all, I just dropped that into the chat. So definitely go check them out. Um, thank you to all those of you who joined us today. Um, yes. Again, the Polly Murray exhibit, Polly Murray, Imp, Crusader, Dude, Priest, is on display currently at the museum, and it'll be up through November 27th. So we hope that if you haven't already checked it out, you'll come visit us and, and take a look, um, or maybe come back again after today's program. Um, and we hope that you'll join us for our next adult program. It's Museum After Dark, Polly Murray, Poetry, Prose, and Sermon Night, happening here at the museum on Friday, October 7th. Doors open at 6 p.m. Thank you, everybody. Have a lovely rest of your day. Thanks, everyone, for coming.